So yesterday, 39-year-old Nicholas Hawkes from Essex became the first person in England and Wales to be sentenced for cyber flashing after it became a criminal offence earlier this year. He's going to serve over 15 months. Cyber flashing is the act of sending unsolicited explicit images, usually on social media, dating apps or airdrop, with the intention of causing alarm or distress. Well, forensic psychiatrist Dr Shaham Das joins us now with his thoughts on the issue, alongside women's safety consultant Karen Wybro, who herself has been a victim of cyber flashing. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Karen, can we start with your reaction to that sentence, that custodial sentence that was given out yesterday, how important that is? Really pleased, actually, to see such a significant custodial custodial sentence being handed down for the first ever conviction for cyber flashing. Um, really good work by Essex Police, who obviously took this seriously and really pursued the case. Um, but it is a specific circumstance, this case, that um, it's great that it sets a precedent, but it's going to be difficult to get continued convictions like this, I think. Why is that? So at the moment, there's the um, you have to prove an intent to cause um, distress or upset sending these images. And we know that the vast majority of, of cyber flashing, actually, it's going to be very difficult to prove that mm. intent. So really, it would be much better if this was a consent based crime rather than intent based. Mm -hmm. And you've actually been directly affected yourself. Tell me about mm -hmm. your experiences. Yeah, I mean, it's happened to me, you know, like millions of women um, and men, actually, but um, predominantly women. This has happened to me on several occasions through various different methods. So on um, social media, for example, mm -hmm. through messaging on social media, mm -hmm. through airdrop on the tube. So it's on um, the tube. Yeah, on the tube. I experienced it. So which I, is what? a different level of intimidation because, you yeah. know, it's somebody quite close in proximity physically to you as well. So just in case anybody at home doesn't understand how airdrop works, because there'll be some of our yeah. viewers that perhaps aren't into it, just can you explain what you're talking about and how mm. that affects you? So through um, your mobile phone, you'll receive a notification saying um, somebody wants to send you a, a message. Do you want to accept it? And you either choose then to accept or decline. Um, so you do have that kind of slight um, edge to be able to, to decline that. Mm. But it's happened to me um, where I could see the guy trying to send a message to, I don't know how many people within that carriage, but I've since changed my mobile phone settings so that it doesn't actually have my name on it, just as a kind of level of protection against you that You can put your again. settings to contacts only, you can yes. turn it off, but the reality is some of those, if you have open to everybody, and yep. sometimes you need that for work, yep. you get a preview as well. Yes, So you do. can see what yep. the image is. So mm -hmm. someone is sitting in that train carriage, yep. randomly sending messages mm -hmm. to any of the people whose airdrop is on. Yes. Uh, Kerry has got in touch with us this morning saying when she was training at the gym, every day she would get set pictures of various, from various men and their body parts. She never asked them. Three of the men had girlfriends or wives, so she sort of knew who they were. Mm. And it's just that sense that men feel like they can do this. It's a real example of, like, male entitlement sexual entitlement that these men have, unfortunately, just to invade your private space, invade your privacy, and to really force something on you that you didn't ask to see. And it shouldn't be treated any differently from someone doing this in a physical space yes. to you. And, and <coughs> so many women are, are affected by it. I mean, in the, this morning office, there's most, the majority of women have, have had a similar experience. How do you report it, though? How do we do that? Because it is such a new crime. It's hard mm. to know what the parameters are. I think the first step is it's really good that people are talking about it, because yeah. especially with younger people, they don't realise that it's an offence. Mm. Um, it's become so normalised in society that people just kind of laugh it off and don't really think it's a big deal. So we need to start telling people, first of all, that it's not acceptable, yeah. um, both the people that are doing it, but also to our young people to say, you know, people shouldn't be doing this to you. You should be able to enjoy your experiences online without this kind of intimidation and upset and harm. But you need to screenshot, you need to document it, and then you need to report it to the police because okay. it is an offence. Okay. One of the people involved, one of the girls, was only 15 yeah. years old, that Nicholas Hawke sent these pictures to, uh, probably hasn't had a phone particularly long. I mean, no. it tends to be around 12, 13, people change schools. There'll be mums and dads at home this morning watching this going, how can we protect our daughters from getting these unsolicited pictures? I mean, in terms of settings on your phone, you can set them up to do that, right? You can, and I would urge every parent to do that. But also, uh, there's lots of e-safety tips that people can give you, but the one most important thing is talk to your children. Yes. Actually, about have honest and real conversations about what's happening, um, because this might be happening in situations between peers as well. And we need to try and have some honest discussions with our young people about 
whether we should be sharing images, what's appropriate, what isn't, and the how they can be used. Yes. That's the thing yeah. no one thinks. Dr. Yes. Shaham, I kind of, I've got two <clears throat> teenage boys, they go to a boys' school. As, 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 as we've just been saying, there is so much about understanding the importance of being safe and not doing all these sorts of things. Yeah. But the implication of this sentence, the custodial sentence, first, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And also, what's the escalation process? Does it go from starting with something like this, cyber flashing, to being something more physical? Sure. So, morning, Ben. Morning, Kat. Morning. Um, the first thing that I would say is that 15 months in general is quite a harsh sentence, but I think in this particular case, it is appropriate because this man, Hawks, he had His a previous history. Yeah. Right? So, previously sexually offended against a minor. As you said before, the, the pictures that he sent, one of them was to a 15-year-old. He's already had a community sentence. He's not learned from his mistakes. So I think it's absolutely appropriate, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, it acts as a deterrent. You know, this is a new law and the police and the nation are taking it seriously. So hopefully it will deter other people that, that, that have these intentions. And to answer your question, Ben, in terms of escalation, absolutely. So these low-level kind of offences can escalate, and there's a number of reasons for that. So some of it is desensitisation, right? So the individual offender, they, they, they need to get more of a kick. It's almost like taking a drug right. to chase that high, so they escalate their behaviour, they make it more serious. And then another thing would be validation as well. So they get some sort of reaction, even if it's a negative reaction, which gets them to continue. And then finally, it's about pushing boundaries. You know, what can I get away with? And I think that's really um, relevant in the case of Wayne Cousins, for example. So we all know yeah. that he had previous low-level offending before he went on to, to commit his horrific crimes. And he got emboldened, and other people in this situation might become emboldened if they're not stopped at an early stage. Right. If they are stopped, though, if they are caught, can they be rehabilitated? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I'm a doctor, I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I, I work in rehabilitating offenders, and I think it's possible if there is some internal motivation and epiphany. It's quite hard to reverse internal perverse impulses and thoughts, mm. but you can control the other risk factors. So, for example, if an offender is more likely to, to commit these kind, of, um, these kind of sexual perverse actions, if they're anxious or depressed, you can treat those mental disorders. Right. If it's because they're drinking and they're disinhibited, you can use drug and alcohol rehab. So you can kind of reduce the risk factors. Well, that was the question I was going to ask you, is why do people do it? Does it stem from other things, essentially? Yeah, so it's, it depends on the uh, actual uh, offender and their makeup, but I would broadly categorise it into, into two camps. There's those who are using it as a clumsy way to, to flirt and to try and start a sexual relationship, and there's those who are actual sexual predators, those who, right. who, who get like a kick, a pleasure out of the control and domination of intimidating their female victims. Do you agree with Karen that it's the same? The cyber flashing is the same as physical actually doing it in public? Um, I suppose it depends on the individual victim. Some people will, will find it very, very intrusive, mm -hmm. regardless of how close the individual is. Other people might feel more intimidated by knowing that somebody's physically in proximity. Yeah. So it, it, there's a massive overlap. I don't know if I'd say it's exactly the same. I think the really scary thing is that 12 to... Uh, girls, 76% of girls aged between 12 and 18 have received unsolicited photos. 12 years old is... Yeah. I mean, that's... It's, it's shocking, isn't it? And I think part of the problem is that, you know, unlike us, the kids nowadays grow up with mobile phones, yes. don't they? So I think it's become over-sexualised videos, uh, you know, sending pictures between boys and girls who are in relationships in schools. There's a lot of peer pressure. It's become almost normalised. Mm -hmm. Protecting them is important. Yes. Uh, Karen, a lot of the women getting in touch with us today talking about dating sites. There's a lot of online dating. It's become a hugely important part of people's lives. Uh, Diane, Sarah, Melanie, they said more or less opening any dating app, any message that's been sent will have some inappropriate pictures for some strange reason. Sarah says most men will do this. They'll send it for whatever reason. It's, it's, it's like that's become part of the, the protocol with these things. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, become much more common, obviously, than, um, than it used to be, because, just because so many people use online platforms now to to meet new people. But, uh, you know, actually Bumble were, was the first company that started campaigning. I was campaigning alongside them to make cyber flashing a crime. Mm -hmm. And they do use software to blur any image that's sent through the app. Right. And there is more that Ofcom could do yes. to, you know, put pressure on other platforms to do that sort of thing. There are ways and means that we can prevent this happening. Um, but we do need to have definitely this social conversation about what's appropriate and what isn't, because I think many men are quite confused about what women want to receive and what they yeah. don't. Yeah. Uh, well, let's hope that this case sort of draws a line in the sand, potentially, and can start yeah. shifting how people perceive these things. Thank you both for Thank joining you. us. Thank, Thank you very much.